Welcome to the Driven Young Podcast with Byron Dempsey, dedicated to educating and inspiring the younger generation around entrepreneurship and practical life skills we aren't taught in school. Created for young people who seek direction in establishing their goals and passions. This podcast provides a platform for discussing the steps taken by professionals in their field related to handling finances, making money online, starting a business, growing a network, and money. Much more. And now your host, Byron Dempsey. My dear family, after five long years of battling this illness, I just can't take it anymore. I feel I have tried everything and just can't see anything but a depressed future. I would like to thank everyone for the loving care you've all shown me. I couldn't ask for anything more. Please don't blame yourselves in any possible way for this, as there is nothing possibly that you could have done. Love always, Graham. P.S. I just can't be a burden any longer. That was a suicide letter written by this week's guest back in 2004. Having been in a deep depression for five years, Graham decided there was no way out. He had done everything he could, but came to the realization that this was his only option left. A few years later, he goes on to co-found the suicide prevention company, Are You OK?, which I'm sure you've all heard of. He is a five times best-selling worldwide author for his book, Back From The Brink, and other books. He now runs and manages his own company alongside Are You OK? and is happily married, living a great life. Co-founder of Are You OK?, Graham Cohen, joins me on the podcast to discuss depression, how he has dealt with it on more than six separate occasions and how we both think it's affecting kids in high school and uni. He shares with us his top tips to dealing with depression, how social media is affecting our mental state, how to tell if you're depressed and how it's probably not as bad as you might think. If you're feeling a bit low or maybe have friends who are, this podcast is going to bring a lot of value to you. Now, over to Graham. Graham, welcome so much to the podcast. Super Lo- excited to have you on. Lovely to join you, Byron. So I just thought... You know, I've done a little intro of you. I thought we'd just jump in and talk about um, your story. You can give us a real kind of snapshot of your life, how you got to where you are. I know you've helped co-found Are You OK Day, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. So just tell me a bit about how you got into that. Uh, I didn't really plan to. (laughs) So I had a a rather, I guess, conventional career. After I grew up in country New South Wales, came down to Sydney, did a commerce degree, Worked in marketing with Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer. Mm. And then I moved into human resources. I worked in recruitment and outplacement, culture change, and moved to a company called AT Carney, and I was working in executive research. And at that stage, we were specializing in technology. And there was the tech crash, the tech crash of 2000. And our business disappeared overnight, and I was sort of leading that business in a very, very short period of time. Hmm. Um, I lost, lost everything. Everything, you know, my job, marriage broke down. Um, had to live with, live with my parents, so an incredibly difficult time. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And that's uh, that was kind of your period of depression, and what led that was what led to the depression. It wasn't the only thing, and I'd, I'd had episodes of depression before, but nothing that severe. Mm. You know, it was it was five years where I was really depressed. I went through, you know, I think it was twenty three different combinations of medication. I had shock therapy or ECT. I was hospitalised. Wow. And um, so this is proper depression. We're not talking. You're not just you know sad and struggling to get up. This is five years of really serious depression. Yeah, really profound, and it is different in that um, you know you can't concentrate. You think black and white. Mm. Um, you can't see any hope, and yeah. uh, in fact, you know, I got to the stage where you know I I was 110 percent convinced that I wouldn't recover, and um, you know wrote a suicide note and attempted to take my life. Yeah, right. And this suicide note you've just uh, just released online last week, actually. And I saw it got some pretty good traction with that. You got picked up by the media. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is that, um, you know, I, I put it in my book, Back From The Brink, mm. like 12 years ago. Yeah. And people commented on it then. But last week, 
just before Are You OK Day was uh, World Suicide Prevention Day. And I just said that um, I'd never shared this before. And the reason I shared it was that uh, I wanted to show people that even though when I wrote that, I was 110% convinced I wouldn't get better. Mm. I wanted to show that, you know, I now have a really meaningful and good life to give people hope if they were feeling in that situation. And also if there were people that saw it, that were trying to support someone, that they'd know to sort of reach out and to ask, are you okay? Yeah. And um, as you said, I, I put it up. I had no idea what would happen, but it, it went viral. It, it had 70,000 views and comments all around the world within yeah. 18 hours. And the ABC saw it. And, uh, you know, it's funny, the day before um, Are You OK Day, I had this call and, you know, the journalist said, I'd seen this, can answer a few questions. And then they posted as their lead story on Are You OK Day. Yeah, wow. And other, um, uh, other media outlets sort of then copied the story, copied and pasted it. So it was quite um, profound the comments or what people said when they reached out like people really appreciated the um the honesty the mm. authenticity sharing uh, something that's very personal very personal and it didn't feel such a big deal for me because i had shared it in my book before but mm. i it just took it a whole new level with social media well it's funny because you know i do a lot of marketing with social media and stuff and it's been in your book for 12 years mm. it's not new it's easy no. to find if people wanted to but, you know, just putting on social media, I guess, with the relevant timing of Are You OK Day coming up. And it just blew up. I remember when I saw it on social media, I thought, that's pretty, it does take, you know, it's pretty brave to go out and just drop that note on social media. Mm. I don't know why it's different when it's on social media and in the book. Like the well, book, I feel like you've bought it. It's got the whole thing. You're telling your whole life story. With social media, you're scrolling through your news feed and you see this note and it's super powerful. Yeah. And uh, people said that they... It stopped them in their tracks when they're scrolling. Mm. <laughs> they actually make comments like that. And these were people who didn't know me. Um, so it, 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 it was very unusual. I, like, I learned that it was very unusual. And then the nature of social media is then very easy to share. Yeah. And so many people shared that didn't even know me, mm. <laughs> which uh, surprised me. New experience for you. Yeah, it was. So you, so you got, I guess you lost everything in this crash yeah you had this kind of four or five years of serious oppression where you felt like everything was pointless and hopeless yeah and what was the turning point because i know your book kind of helped you did had you gotten out of depression and then you wrote the book or was it like you use the book and the book started getting successful and it kind of gave you more opportunities and that's how you got out of it it was um a combination of that when I, I just resolved after being unwell for a long time to begin walking and walking in nature and i'd sort of start walking you know, 20 minutes and then probably eventually about an hour every day. Mm. And that really helped to boost my mood. I reached out to family and friends who I, you know, isolated myself from because when you're depressed, you know, you almost feel, well, you feel ashamed, quite frankly. Yeah. And so I, I pulled back, but I made a conscious effort to catch up for a coffee with people. And even though I didn't feel like it, it actually, I felt better afterwards. It was, you know, really good. And then... I had this idea of writing the book um, because I wanted to, I guess, have some sort of purpose from this pain and suffering and mm. loss. And and it also, it did give me a sense of purpose and it was like working on something bigger than me. And even some days I didn't feel like it. I just said, well, you know, I've got to do it, you know, mm. because I, I just felt that it would help people having these stories. And, and, and that's what did happen. You know, I, I got... Again, just sort of hundreds of um, emails of people just saying a particular story helped because I interviewed, you know, 10 people who'd been through really bad depression or anxiety and bipolar. And they all mentioned someone or someone's story. And it was often someone like them, you know, someone who had, uh, it was just like them. And they got inspiration by... And you wanted to be person. that someone for a lot yeah, of Yeah, well, I guess it just gave people hope. And that, that was the plan. So yeah. it was, it's very nice when that's validated. Awesome. And so now you're, you've got a whole personal brand. If you Google you, you've got a whole website with everything you do, resilience and strength and training. Mm. You're um, the co-founder of Are You OK Day? So mm. you're running all this stuff. I'm just curious, when you finished high school, 
what did you go to uni did you take a year off what did you do and is it you know did you think you'd be here when you finished high school I don't think you have any idea, really. Um, you don't really have any idea. But I, I had a pretty... After I finished high school, I was a Rotary Exchange student to Canada. So I had a year in Canada, which is very, very cool. Doing... Um, it was finally year of high school. So I'd already done high school in Australia, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Oh, My yeah. results yeah, didn't yeah. matter, so it was very cool. So I did courses like film appreciation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, so I came back, went to uni, um, got jobs at a uh, marketing job with Johnson & Johnson and... Pfizer, and then it just gradually mm. evolved. And I and I did have episodes of depression along the way. Um, but, you know, so I had really three parts to my career. The first was uh, sales and marketing. The second part was human resources. And then after, you know, I crashed and burned, I wrote the book and then got involved in starting Are You OK? And I, um, I just want to clarify that the founder of Are You OK? was Gavin Larkin and I was involved in helping him to start it. Mm. And um, But we still, Gavin passed away from cancer in 2011, so we still like to say he was the sole founder. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, but seeing that grow um, from just an idea to the situation 10 years later where 80% of Australians um, know about it and over 30% have actually asked someone, are you okay? Mm. And it really has become a very strong Australian brand. And that is very, very rewarding. We've got a great team of people. And I think, um, you know, particularly if your audience is a real message in this, because when we started that we had no money, we had no employees. And so we had to be digital right from the start. You know, we we went straight onto Facebook, we went straight onto YouTube. Mm. Um, all the things were downloadable um, straight onto Instagram. Um, and that's how we spread it because people are amazed that we've only got 12 employees, whereas someone like Beyond Blue has got 200 employees. Yeah. And yet our awareness is just as strong as Beyond Blue's. Um, so, you know, I think that's the potential for your generation is if you are, if you have got a great purpose you really believe in, there is a way to amplify it very quickly. Through social media. Yeah. And that's something we talk about a lot kind of in the community that I'm with is mm. really if you're starting a business just because you want money, it's probably not going to, you might succeed, but it, it's not going to succeed as much as someone who has a purpose. They're starting mm. the business because they have a purpose. Mm. And so that's why Are You Okay Day is huge at school. I, mm. I remember in high school, mm. you normally find out two weeks before it's happening. Mm. There's posters all over the school. So you've obviously built a really good brand and have, having 12 in a team is incredible for something that's so big. Is it, I'm not sure, is it global yet or is it just in Australia? We get um, 10 inquiries a week about people wanting to take it overseas. Yeah. And so far we've resisted that because we wanted to get it right in Australia. But mm. funnily enough, we are just um, doing a market assessment at the moment and really it's highly likely that next year we will expand in some form to other countries, maybe two or three countries, because there is nothing really like it around the world. You know, there's other, you know, suicide prevention um, causes. But one of the very clever things, and this was Gavin's um, gift, because he was the CEO of an advertising agency, mm. he could have started World you know, Suicide Prevention Day and nothing would have yeah. happened. But the Are You OK let people know what to do. Yeah. But the tagline also was really meaningful, and that was a conversation could change your life. And everyone can relate to that. It's not mm. just about suicide. You just know, you know, someone who's going through a tough time, whether it's financially or losing a job, the right conversation, the right supportive and caring conversation can make a real difference. Absolutely. And that's the reason why it has grown exponentially. Yeah, I mean, the marketing behind just the name, Are You OK? Because you instantly know what the day is about. Mm. Even if you've never heard it before, oh, it's Are You OK Day today? OK. You know, it's very smart. And you can tell it's come from uh, two people who have a background in advertising and marketing. Mm. So I kind of want to move on and talk, you know, get, talk deeper into this kind of whole depression thing because in today's society with social media with everything i think i think depression is a very overused term yeah. it's used just as someone who's feeling a little bit sad 
yeah. you know, they'll be like, oh, I've got an assignment tonight. Oh, it's, you know, I'm depressed or something. They'll, they'll just use it when they're not actually depressed. And so what is, if you were to de- de- define what depression actually is, yeah. how would you sum that up? What actually is it? Because I've got no idea. I yeah. haven't experienced it. Yeah. I think that's an incredibly good point. And I had my first episode of depression when I was 21 and I had no idea what it was. You know, mm. it wasn't talked about. Like I'm now 61, so it's 40 years ago. Yeah. And it was, there was no awareness. There was no Beyond Blue. There was no Black Dog Institute. But the good thing about what's happened is that people know what it is now but it has become overused there's no doubt about it so what clinical depression is is when you have numerous symptoms every day for a week and those symptoms include you know loss of appetite loss of energy change in sleep patterns change in appetite change in libido and when you have three or four of those every day for a week that's considered to be clinical depression Hmm. and there's Really two types of um, depression is what's called reactive depression, which is, you know, when something bad happens, you know, you lose, death in the lose a parent or something yeah. like that, you not surprisingly go down and um, that's called reactive depression. But there's also something, something called endogenous depression. And what that means is that, well, they believe that there's more of a genetic um, component to that and it can strike and it becomes quite profound, like people's thought slows down, their speech slows down, everything slows down. But when you have, um, you know, clinical depression, it is very different to just feeling sad because it also allows you to lose hope for the future. And that's a big difference. So you kind of just answered my second question, which was how much do you, do you personally think depression is biological? Kind of the nature versus nurture thing. Yeah. Is it people, their, their scenario, maybe they've had a tougher life, which is, they don't have as much food on the table, so it's easier to get depressed. Or someone who's got exactly the same lifestyle, yeah. but someone's really happy and someone's depressed yeah. because of biological. How much is, is depression biological? If any. They say, they say that um, mood is determined by three things, and 50% is our genetics. So some people are just born more robust, more resilient than others or happier Mm. than others. And and I think we can see that in people around us. Mm. The other two, I think, are quite interesting. They say that 10% is the events that happen in our lives. And um, because we can't really control those. But I think the very encouraging thing and the the really bit that I like to share in in my presentations and workshops is that 40% is by our intentional actions, what we choose to do each day. Hmm. And we do have control over that. You know, we do have control whether we go for a 30-minute walk. We do have control whether we catch up with a good friend. We do have control whether we meditate or choose to have a good night's sleep. Or stay at home watching Netflix. Or stay at home watching Netflix and streaming Netflix. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, some of Saborn are dealt with a poorer hand from a Gen X point of view, but there's still a lot we can do. And that's the message that I like to uh, share. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's a good message because depression seems to be a huge thing in the younger generation. I personally know a lot of people who have been depressed that so they claim they were. Mm. I think it is kind of, I was discussing with someone oh, a year or two ago. There's a whole psychological thing from when you when a doctor diagnoses you with depression, mm. it's kind of like you just accept it. Mm. So you think you're feeling sad. You go to a doctor, he says, yeah, you're actually depressed. Now you go, oh, I can't get out of bed because I'm depressed. You've got an, it's like a scapegoat. Mm. You can use the fact that you're clinically depressed as an excuse to not get better. What are mm. your thoughts on that? Yeah, that can be, it can be a reaction. And I hope that doctors are getting more, um, more positive in their language about that because, you know, it is good to know that you are being affected by an illness that you know you may not have a great deal of control of. But the really important thing to know is that little things can make a big difference. And regular exercise has been like just a 30 minute brisk walk over, you know, you do that five days out of seven. Yeah. That's been shown to be just as effective as antidepressants for mild depression. Wow. And there's there's just there's no downside with having a 30 minute brisk walk. And so hopefully more doctors are talking about that. There's also incredible value in getting outside, you know, getting Mm. in the sun, vitamin Ds, all that sort of stuff. There's great value in catching up with good friends, people that are good for us. So my message is you can't be passive about it. And I obviously have a predisposition to depression. I've had, you know, six episodes in my life. But I'm... Sorry, just six episodes, does that mean you've got... 
you've had depression, you've gotten good, you've had it again, gotten good. So yeah. that's not all in one hit. That's no. six separate. Six separate. Six oh, wow. sep- okay. six, six separate episodes since I was 21. Yeah, wow. Um, but, you know, because I've been there, I'm, I am really disciplined about, you know, meditating each day, exercising each day, catching up with family and friends. Mm. And I know that that helps to immunise me. So no pills? Just uh... Uh, I don't take any pills at all whatsoever now. But I do stress that some people can get great relief from antidepressants. Um, but you can't rely on that by itself. A big mistake. Combination of you both. have to you have to try multiple strategies because you don't know what's going to work. Mm. You know, for some people, exercising can have a great effect. Um, for some people, de- um, antidepressants can give them a boost, but you just can't rely on that solely. So these other strategies just help to get a scaffolding around you. Yeah, and doing a thirty minute walk is very easy. It's very easy. You can do it. Everyone has time to do that. Everybody. You know, whether it's, you know, before you work, at lunchtime, after work, everybody can do it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a good little takeaway. Um, So something I thought would be really interesting to talk about would be social media and just how we live in a world right now. Everyone, when you look on Instagram, these Instagram models or whatever it is, they're only showing the highlights of their life. And so people perceive this as a happy lifestyle. There's, you know, it's highlight after highlight after highlight after highlight after highlight. And so I think when people see this, they think that's what a happy lifestyle is. And when they don't have it in cause, you know, them to feel sad, when really it's just human, you know, being human is having highs and then having lows, except on Instagram, we don't see the lows. Yeah. What are your thoughts on social media and affecting the younger generation with not depression, but, you know, making kind of feeling shit about yourself or comparisons? Yeah. The comparison thing is huge, and there's actually research that shows that the longer you spend on social media, the greater your unhappiness and and um, and mental health problems. Mm. So it's not as because there is a lot of that comparison, and people think, "Oh wow, they're having the perfect life." Here's me. I'm you know not getting sunset shop, not going on the beach each yeah. day, not with all my friends having a wonderful time. And there's great things about it. But I think it's really important to be aware that there's big downsides as well. You know, little bits and pieces are really good. One thing that I thought, um, there's a guy called uh, Nia Eel, and he wrote, originally wrote a book called Hooked. And he was the first one to really document why people get hooked on social media. He worked out what people do, what Facebook does, what Instagram Mm. does um, to do that. And so he documented it. It's, it's, it's actually a science how they make it addictive. And he has now um, written a book called Indistractable. And so it's about how not to get hooked or how to be more focused in what you do. And one of the things that he recognizes is that social media in itself isn't a bad thing, but it can be a distraction. So if we're bored, or we're a bit anxious or what have you, it can be quite natural to go to social media as a distraction. Mm. And so one of the first things he talks about in Indistractable is learning how to be comfortable with the internal triggers. You know, be comfortable just feeling bored, (laughs) be comfortable feeling a bit stressed. I think I've heard this before. Because people, you know, you sit down and have breakfast and you start watching YouTube. You can always go be stimulated by social media or some sort of, typically your phone or Netflix or whatever it is. So it's just being comfortable in the moment. Comfortable in the moment and also comfortable with the fact that life isn't all, you know, beer and honey, all <laughs> beer and skittles. You know, it's, it's, uh, all of us have ups and downs. Being human, I think. It's being human and uh, it's knowing. And I think the big thing, if you do get comfortable with experience discomfort, it passes. It's even like hunger. You know, I, I do intermittent mm-hmm. fasting actually and... I used to think, well, you know, if you get hungry, I'll just get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. Well, you don't. Mm, you <laughs> you, know, you have it and then you par- it passes. And it's also the same with boredom or even a bit of distress. You can have discomfort, but it doesn't mean it's going to last forever. You can, you know, you can do breathing exercises. You can try and be really observant by looking, you know, at a beautiful flower or something outside. Yeah. And it passes. And I think the thing with having the phones on us 24-7 is that's the natural thing that we move to to distract ourselves well second you're not engaging with someone or you're not doing anything it's just instinct to pull out your phone and just meaninglessly scroll 
you're not achieving anything. I, I do it all the time. I always catch myself I'm like, why am I doing this? What's the purpose? I'm not even liking, I'm just scrolling through my news feed. It's so pointless. But the thing you'll find, Byron, and you will see this, you go on a train or a bus, everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what age they are. And, and, and I think people have lost a bit the ability to daydream. And there's something not good about that because um, with daydream and with being comfortable in our own skin, you know, new things happen, creativity happens. Hmm. I think what I've kind of tried to do is like in the train or bus scenario, let's say I'm traveling somewhere, is I listen to a lot of podcasts. Mm. So I try, while listening to the podcast, just listen to the podcast. Don't scroll through your feed. Because sometimes I've done that and I'm like, I just did not listen to the past 10 minutes and I'll have to, to reverse it. Yeah. So I listen to podcasts. So even if you listen to music, you don't have to be on your phone. You can just sit in the train and listen to music or just sit in the train and listen to the podcast. And I find that's an effective way to kind of still get the stimulation but not get the the pointless scrolling yeah so you can yeah. still kind of be in the moment but while also kind of learning or listening having you know comedy podcast whatever it is and i think that's a really good point just doing one thing you know because if there is a, there is that temptation to listen and scroll at the same time well you don't achieve anything mm. <laughs> you can't engage in what's on instagram and you can't engage you can't remember what you listen to yeah the generation of multitasking yeah. like people think we can do it we can't <laughs> like all the evidence says we can't yeah and i think something like when you start multitasking your product productivity like halves and then if you're doing three things at once it goes down again or something ridiculous it is it's crazy there's like an exercise where you do the alphabets a b c d e f g and then you count one two three four five six seven to twenty and then you try to go one a one two B to, and you can see when you're multitasking, it's way slower. And yeah, it's just, just it's just killer. I struggle with it so bad. The, um, well, the you know, we all do. We all do. Um, but, you know, when I walk, for example, and I walk or do exercise most mornings, I really do try to just walk. <laughs> mm. And just stay in the moment. Yeah. Awesome. Mm. And um, so I want to talk about your book, mm. Back from the Brink. So when did you write this? Uh, I've done three in this uh, in series. So the first one was 12 years ago, and then I did one which was called Back from the Brink 2, which for, was for <coughs> loved ones and how best to help someone. And then this one was an international version um, where, you know, I had uh, the former UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair, wrote uh, the, the a testimonial. The actress, Glenn Close, wrote, yeah. um, wrote the foreword and... You know, I interviewed some more well-known people from both the US and the UK. And um, to my amazement, it um, was picked up in China. <laughs> and uh, this is back from the brink and this says Graham County. I have no idea what it says, what, what the bird is yeah, about. <laughs> so maybe some of your listeners who, um, you know, are Chinese could explain to it. But it has become... Um, bestseller in china so it's a bestseller in australia or worldwide yeah worldwide well it's strong in australia strong in the u.s but the biggest sales are in china oh really yeah there you go yeah it's fascinating it's a big country <laughs> so how is how's a book affected your life has it opened opportunities what it like and you wrote it so after your five-year depression yeah yeah as a way of helping other people being that person we spoke about earlier yeah, well, it was it was helping other people. But it was also helping me. Mm. Like, quite frankly, it was an important part of my recovery when I did as come a project to focus as a on. project. Um, but but it wasn't a me project. I, was, I kept on thinking, how can it help other people? And that was, I think, something that really helped me keep going. Um, but it did. It led you know, when the first book came out. It led to lots of publicity because I had mm. some well-known people in the book, and I had two hundred media interviews in a month. Wow. Like 200. 200, yeah, radio. And this was really, so this is 12 years ago. So it was before podcasts really were popular, but I did radio and um, paper and, uh, and TV. And what I learned from that was that, that, you know, depression touches lots of people. But most of the people that contacted me were actually those who were trying to support those that had depression. And that's how I knew that Are You OK was a really good thing because that's mm. who we targeted, the people surrounding those that were, that were struggling. And, it, and you're right, it did lead to lots of opportunities, Funnily enough, from, from country areas. 
Um, I was asked to go and speak all over country Queensland, country New oh, South really? Wales, country Victoria, because those places often have very poor resources. They don't have psychologists or psychiatrists. Do they have higher suicide rates? They do. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Okay. And um, and then it was interesting because I came from the corporate area. I'd worked for you know Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer, and management consulting companies. And I went back to workplaces and said, look, I want to talk about this in the workplace. And everyone said, oh, we don't have any problems here. No one's depressed. No one's anxious. Mm. It's all under control. <laughs> Not a problem. But that's all changed in the last sort of four years with this general recognition of how big the problem is. And I think the other thing that really changed was that I learned how to express it in a way that everyone related to. Because I talked about a moodometer. And, you know, moodometer 0 to 10. 10 is where what I call the green zone, you know, where you're more optimistic, more resourceful, more energetic, more grateful. Yeah. And the red zone where you're depressed, angry, anxious. And we all slide around that moodometer. You know, we spend time in the in the amber zone. But everyone can relate to it because we're all somewhere on that moodometer. And I think it's just really important to think about, you know, what can I do to move up to the next? If I'm in the red zone, how do I get to the amber zone? If I'm in yeah. the amber zone, how do I get to the green zone? And that just really made it really universal in the workplace. And so, you know, talking about um, seven rituals of resilient people, talking about mastering your mood, talking about building a green zone team, um, all really resonated in the workplace and took it from a, a niche book about mental illness to, you know, something that, you know, every, every workplace embraces now. Yeah. And so it's almost a standard for workplace health? Yeah, well, workplace well-being. But it also relates to productivity as well because there's research that shows, published in Harvard Business Review, that if you're in the green zone, you're 31% more productive. Of course. 37% sense. more influential, 300% more creative. And I think we all know that, but to, to actually see numbers on it... Yes, yeah, physical is, numbers. Uh, yeah. As opposed to just... Yeah, that would make sense. If you're feeling better, you're going to be more productive, more... And more happier in the workplace. Yeah. So before we fully wrap up, I kind of have something I'd love, love to explore. Just uh, one final question. Mm. If you were to give one piece of advice to the younger generation, think in high school, uni students, uh, does, it can be anything you want. It doesn't have to be around depression. What would your one piece of advice be? My one piece of advice would be not to pursue happiness. And what I mean by that is I think the Western um, view of happiness is wrong and it's all about me and how can I feel great and what do I need to feel great. Yeah. What I would advise people to do, if I had my time again, I would stress trying to be useful, trying to be helpful and to really have a, a spirit of care and that's self-care and it's also caring for others. And I think if you're in that good place, if you're good with yourself, if you stay in the green zone, then you're in a position where you can grow, where you can evolve. So I finish my you know, keynotes and my presentations by encouraging people to be caring, be helpful, which is about being useful, and going for the growth zone. So that's, what I, that's the advice I'd give my younger self. Don't pursue happiness. Don't pursue Sounds happiness. Sounds very uh, counteractive as opposed to most people who would say pursue happiness. That's my recommendation. Pursue awesome. purpose and usefulness. Awesome. Graham, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Byron. All right. If you are still here, thank you so much for listening to this entire episode. If you got some value out of it, it would mean the world to me if you left a review on iTunes or shared it with your friends or family. Otherwise, I'll be putting up videos of this episode on Instagram and Facebook. So check it out there at Byron Dempsey or at Driven Young Podcast. And I'll see you on the next one.